My name is Scott Schnipper, and I'm 56 years old, and what I'm recounting is the death of my uh, late brother Stephen Schnipper in March of 2009. He, my brother committed suicide by taking an overdose of pills. He was discovered by a couple who were friendly with him and had been trying to help him. They found him that night, and they called me, and... Uh, told me they had found my brother on the floor of his kitchen. So my heart began racing, and I didn't know what to think or do except get in a cab and drive over the Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan, and whereupon I found this scene filled with uh, the New York City Police Department and the New York City Medical Examiner's Office. And um, I never actually entered the apartment that day, that night. I just stayed out in the hallway and saw a medical department employee bring my brother out. And that was the beginning of this horrible journey. And then in the midst of, of my dealing with this all, my second son was born in July of that year. So it was 2009 was an incredible year filled with the highest highs and the lowest lows. I don't think there's anything to prepare you. And you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy, but you do get through it. And you have friends and family and, and you most of all, I think, have yourself because, first of all, there's a large community of people who don't know how to help, don't want to help, don't aren't capable. They're in shock themselves. They're, they have their own limitations going into the event. There are many times subsequently when you're dealing with the aftershocks for the days and weeks and months afterwards where you have to go for walks and find something beautiful in the world and deal with it yourself. But I was blessed. I had a partner who was able to do so much of the practical things. My brother committed suicide without a will. There were accounts without beneficiaries, and he left no note. And the way my wife, Laura, could help was by saying, okay, this is what the state of New York says you have to do in order to be able to take control of things. You think of all these triggers that happened in the prior two years to my brother taking his own life. And they were definitely contributing factors, and they may have been the thing that tipped him over the edge. The loss of the job, the loss of income, the loss of self-esteem, the, the antidepressants, and just one cocktail mix after another. You know, people have a history before they reach these, these seemingly cataclysmic turns in the road. And then there was the expanse of Stephen's life 54 years before those last two years. Stephen was a gay male who came out after college, to my family anyway, and it was very painful, and my mother wasn't loving and accepting. Stephen had a history of, of depression that I was unaware of. I didn't want to see it, or I didn't need to see it, uh, because he never came to me for any sort of help. I will carry many of these questions around forever. I mean, they will, there's, there are no answers. In a way that, you know, an 89-year-old grandparent passing of natural causes doesn't leave you with those sorts of questions. Surviving a suicide will leave I can't imagine it won't leave anyone with a whole host of unanswered questions. And I, my projection is very few of those questions ever get answered. Very few. With or without a note. I went to a couple of support groups for suicide survivors, sort of like bereavement groups. One was for uh, specifically for siblings, only for brothers and sisters of people who had committed suicide. And that was, that's under the auspices of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP. So they run these support groups throughout the country. Then there was a Jewish group I found, again, through my wife, I'm sure. That was for any survivors. And that was under the auspices of a rabbi, bearing in mind this whole Jewish prohibition against suicide. So for someone who doesn't have a big network, they can find, they can find support groups, bereavement groups, or suicide survivors groups. If someone's in a church or a synagogue or a temple of some sort to reach out uh, that way. Although I said that I did rely on myself a lot and took long walks, but I think for, I had a, a, a wide social circle from which to draw. And for someone who didn't have that, I think they really need to reach out at the same time as they reach in. I think it's even more important for them. And Reed Williams' Sirens, Darkness Visible. It's a short little memoir of his fight with depression and an amazing account for an outsider looking in to what depression must feel like.
I don't have any trite answers about how to deal with someone who may be depressed or may or may not be suicidal because those are bigger questions than I'm capable of answering. I hope that I've become a little more charitable to varying degrees and just try to understand and put yourself in someone else's shoes that you never know what's going on in someone's head.